We're delighted to talk to retired Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Johns, Knight Grand Cross of the Most Honourable Order of the Bath, Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, Commander of the Order of the British Empire and Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. A fighter pilot in the 1960s, Sir Richard served as one of three British directors of the operations on the senior planning staff for Op Granby during the first Gulf War in 1991 and then acted as a supporting commander for joint operations in the Balkans in 1994. As Chief of the Air Staff, he advised the British Government on the Air Force aspects of the Strategic Defence Review and on NATO's air campaign in Kosovo. We are here to talk to him about his book, a memoir of his time in the service, entitled Bolts from the Blue. Sir Richard, I'm delighted that you've uh, allowed us to come and talk to you about your new book, which I might say has got a fantastic painting of you on the cover. That is amazing. Bolts from the Blue. Um, so let me first ask you, um, having enjoyed your book, um, particularly your recollections of flying the Hunter FR-10 on 1417 flight, and of course the Harrier, um, who do you imagine your book's audience to be uh, when you wrote it and to who, whom do you think it will mainly appeal? Well I think the first part of the book will I hope appeal to people who've got a genuine interest in flying airplanes because the first part of the book is very much about my various experiences on various types of airplanes and I, I was inc incredibly lucky because I didn't just stay on one airplane you know I moved around a lot so if anything I became dare I say, you know, a jack of all trades rather than something like a master of one. And then of course, and as, as one became more senior, the focus of one's life changed in, in a sense that uh, although flying was still very important, and although one grabbed every opportunity to um, expand one's knowledge of various types of aeroplanes and the military role of those aeroplanes, other aspects in one's life became more important. And I thought it particularly necessary to try and record in the book, partly for historical value as it were, partly for general interest to people who've got uh, a, a wider interest in defence, what exactly was happening to the service at the end of the Cold War until I retired. So rather hopefully it'll appeal to a very wide audience uh, and rather hopefully those who start reading the book about aeroplanes and so on will continue to get a wider picture of the RAF's history over the second half of the last century. I'm sure that will prove to be the case. Going back to your early days as a young man, probably not that ever going to imagine you were going to reach air rank, <laughs> let alone be the most senior man in the Royal Air Force. Um, you were out there in uh, uh, Salala and uh, you were flying uh, your photo reconnaissance hunters. Fighter reconnaissance. Uh, thank you, FR, fighter reconnaissance. Um, now. I was intrigued by some of the missions you flew, particularly one that required you to shut down the engine had you diverted because of the enormous distance between you and your diversion airfield so that you could reach it with enough fuel to relight it and land. Was that within the rules at the time? Yeah, I mean, that's what we were briefed to do. I mean, we were <coughs> flying out of um, Salala um, Mazera is about, I don't know, 300 nautical miles, you know, up to the northeast of uh, Salala. Um, we had a, another airfield over the Jebel, to, to the north of Salala, if you know that area, there, there's the Jebel, and then you're in, getting into the desert. And there was an airfield there, which I think is, I think it's called Thumrate. In those days, uh, it was known as Midway. It was a very small airfield used by uh, oil prospectors uh, and so on. Um, the trouble was that uh, Salala was a sand runway and uh, we were flying hunters off it with you know, high pressure with tires and there were no crash facilities at Salala. So when we came back uh, to the airfield we would sort of go out into a very long line astern. Um, so one guy, would, the, the leader would touch down first uh, so that you were not, you know, you knew that at least you had a runway to land on and you hadn't burst a tire 
uh, uh, otherwise, if you have burst a tyre, the brief, and this is, I mean, brief diversion technique was to immediately blow the tanks off, turn left or northeast, because we were obviously at the Herring South uh, for um, Mazera, and then do what we called a light climb up to 36,000 ish, because we had no met uh, facilities or, or whatever, and we took 36 as the average height of the, of the tropopause, and so on, and off we set. And uh, I forget the actual gliding distance out, but the brief was that when they were about 100, I forget, 100, 150 odd miles out, you flame the engine out and you glid. And if everything worked out right, according to our planning, you would end up at Mazera, 2,000 feet downwind uh, to land when you relit the engine and you landed. Now, that was the, that was the brief concept, uh, not concept, that was what we were briefed to do. Fortunately, we didn't have to do it because no one burst a tyre. Well, thank the Lord for that. Well, it would have been interesting you know, to see <laughs> it if it worked would, out. <laughs> it, it would have been. And um, flying around those areas, being shot at by the odd tribesmen and things, it must have been a wonderful place to cut your teeth as a young fighter pilot. Well, yes. I mean, the, 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 the operations that we were doing up in Amman were very different from our standard day-to-day -day stuff down in what was then the Federation of South Arabia. Um, the strike wing at the time had uh, two hunter squadrons, 8 and 43, flying the Hunter 9. There was 14, 17 flight. There were just six of us on that flight, and we were fighter recce people. And then, believe it or not, we had a Shackleton squadron in strike wing uh, uh, as well. who we used to drop 1,000-pound aerial grenades, letting them <laughs> you and me as 1,000-pound bombs, uh, when, when required. Um, but on 1417, we were all um, at least second tourists. Uh, uh, on 8 and 43, they obviously had a, most of the junior pilots were first tourists, and you're absolutely right. It was a smashing place for them to go, you know, to cut their teeth, as you put it, in an operational role. Absolutely. And in the last two years, we never lost a pilot. Well, that's a tantamount to the uh, supervision and the fact that uh, they were pretty good hands in those days. Well, but they're very high quality leadership. In fact, it was, those squadrons were commanded by squadron leaders in those days, and uh, the flight commanders were obviously were senior flight lieutenants. We were all flight lieutenants uh, on 1417. Um, and as I say in the book, we got the, the, the JPUs used to call us 14 canteen because the <laughs> flight commanders and the senior flight lieutenants used to come across to our place for a bit of peace and quiet and a <laughs> cup of coffee every now and again. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Moving you, you on, uh, I noticed that you mentioned you had a green endorsement. Now, not everyone will understand what that is and what a rare achievement uh, it is uh, in the Royal Air Force. Perhaps you could explain what it is and tell us a little bit more about well, what you did to get one in your logbook. Um, well, I, I did my first tour, I was a night fighter pilot on my first tour, uh, flying javelins. And um, we were on detachment uh, out in Cyprus doing an armament practice camp. Uh, air to air firing against you know towed flags towed by meters and so on and uh, I, I was on the flag one day and the, it was towing at about 20,000 feet and it used to come in uh, on a uh, it used to be perched about 1500 yards out I forget exact distance about 1500 feet higher than the tow and then you'll come in on a curve of pursuit um, never less than 10 degrees uh, angle off to the towing aeroplane Otherwise, they used to get very miffed. Um, and as you came in, the, the nav rat in the back would lock onto the tow bar to give you range. And your job, of course, was to uh, track the flag and fire at it. And of course, it was only a split second. Then you sort of roll the wings level and you went over the top of the flag, you know, ne never uh, underneath it. And on this particular occasion, as I went over the top of the flag, I started to roll and then sort of to sort of ease the stick forward. And I suddenly realized the stick was absolutely jammed solid um, in the fore and aft plane. I, could, I had aileron control, but I had absolutely no uh, tail plane control uh, on it. It's it absolutely solid. Um, so we just went on up. And I thought, hmm. And so I, then st I thought, well, if I'm going up now, because that means the stick has obviously got the tail plane up. So if I roll the aeroplane upside down, it'll start going down again, you know, like actually right doing a barrel. Mm. So we, that's basically what we started doing. These huge barrels, and fortunately, because I was high, there's room about. So you start throttling back and you start thinking. And I told my leader, Daryl Ken Scott, I said, I've got a bit of a problem. I've got the, the, the stick's jammed. It, it's absolutely, and I've got no elevator control or tail plane control. 
And anyway, to cut a very long story short, eventually by using, you know, you had these huge variable air brakes in the Javelin and by basic aerodynamics, you know, using the, the air brakes to get the speed back, uh, throttle, you know, if you push flight and the nose will go up, pull it back, the nose will go down sort of thing. Got it into reasonable straight and level flight. And by, there's a teeny weeny bit of, um, of, uh, of vertical control on the, on the trimmer, just a teeny weeny bit. And I discovered that when I got the speed back, you know, below you know, 200 knots, I could uh, get, the, get the gear down. And then I also discovered again by fiddling around with both the power and the air brakes, I could set up a rate of descent. Ken Scott told me, and he'd obviously been on the squadron up at RAF Nicosia to put the airplane over uh, Akrotiri at 10,000 feet, pointed out to sea and eject. Well, we got down there and um, I said to Dave Holtz, who was my navigator, I said, OK, I'll well, put you at 10,000 feet over the airfield, which was the optimum height for ejecting and out you go. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure yet, but I've got a feeling that if I can get, I can get the airplane far enough out, we can actually fly, you know, a, a stand of about 500 foot, 600 foot rate of descent. And I will aim it at the runway threshold. Akrotiri, of course, was a very, very long runway. It still is today. And that's basically what I did. Um, and we hit the uh, well, we hit, I forget how far up the runway. It was a long time ago, but I hit the airfield going pretty fast. Uh, in the normal speed, roundout speed in the Javelin, I think it was about 145, 150 knots. When I hit it, I think I was doing about 170, 180. And the airplane bounced up in the sky. And I thought, oh God, I've blown it. And, uh, but fortunately, because of that huge delta wing uh, that it was, that sort of cushioned the blow when we hit the deck. And uh, we, we cleared the runway. And um, so uh, I, you know, we taxied off. Actually, it was quite amusing because it was also, well, from my point of view, as a very feckless flying officer at the time, it was also the day of the AOCNC's inspection, annual inspection of RAF Akrotiri. And we had been told uh, up at Nicosia, no diversion to Akrotiri unless it's for real. Well, the parade was all out. This is what I've been told, uh, how true it is. But all of a sudden, the crash alarm goes and half the parade disappears. <laughs> that, that's what I'm told. I can't vouch for that. But a servicing party came down from Akr uh, was flown down by Chopper, direct from, um, from Nicosia. And they found basically a bolt that got stuck in the uh, control lines somewhere or the other. And... Um, that, that, you know, and they took it out and boss phoned me up and said, All right, do some, you know, make sure everything works, fly it back to Nicosia. So I flew it back to Nicosia that evening. Wow. And um, later on, they gave me the green endorsement. Well, AOC 11 Group, I think it was, gave me a green endorsement, <laughs> which is basically something nice to have in your log book where it says, you know, you, you did a good job. As opposed to a red endorsement, which I have to admit I wasn't aware of. Uh, oh, yes. I, the, 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 as I, th as I said, I, I, there was one chap on the squad who had a red endorsement in his uh, log book uh, from Meteor Days, and he also had a green endorsement. He got them both on the same sortie. The red endorsement for taking off with no fuel at night and the green endorsement for bringing the aeroplane back and dead sticking it without a scratch on the aeroplane. I wonder if the, his AOC might have had a bit of a sense of humour. They didn't seem to have much sense of humour in those days, but that's just a personal recollection. I love it. I love it. Um, now, you went on to become a flying instructor. And, of course, you had a, a student which some of us would have looked at as a, as a gift from heaven and others would have avoided like the plague. In other words, you were asked to train a member of the royalty. So mm. perhaps you could explain a little a bit about that. Well, I mean, I, when I, I, I went, I, I was a non-volunteer for CFS when I left uh, 1417 flight. And um, someone on the flight said the best instructing to do is basic instructing. You don't want to do this advanced stuff. Well, anyway, I went to Risington and one trip in the Jet Provost Mark III convinced me that the one thing I didn't want to do was basic instructing. So I promptly volunteered for the NAT and I, I instructed on the NAT for a while. Uh, and then I was promoted to squadron leader. And uh, I thought, well, I've done my instructing. I'll now go back, you know, to the front line because Phantoms, Buccaneers, Harriers were all coming into service. And my postings officer told me, nope, um, you're going to go to Cranwell uh, and command a Jet Provost Squadron. So this was not good news. But anyway, having said that, when I got to Cranwell and uh, I discovered there was more to basic instructing than I 
and, than I thought. And the Jet Provost Mark IV, of course, was not, well, it was a marked improvement on the Jet Provost Mark III. And anyway, there I was, I was instructing, I was commanding a squadron. I had some very interesting students uh, going through at the time. And uh, I then went to become deputy chief flying instructor. And when I was there, uh, and I'd been at Cranwell, I suppose, at that stage for about a year and a half, something like that, I suddenly got uh, you know, phoned up to be told to report to the commander in chief flying training command. And so I said, what for? And they said, do what you're told and go down there and report <laughs> to see him. So I went down to, I think it was to Brampton. And the outer office gave me no, I was thinking, what the hell have I done now? Sort of, you know, get that feeling of all the sort of little guilt complexes come back to you. And I went in to, marched in to see the commander in chief, who was uh, Air Marshal Derek Hodgkinson, Air Vice Marshal Derek Hodgkinson at the time. He was the acting CNC. And he said, well, sit down. And then he just said to me, how would you like to be the Prince of Wales' flying instructor? Was it, that was a real bolt from the blue. I bet it was, absolutely. Was it a bit under the covers, a bit hush-hush at the time? Well, I, I don't know how hush-hush it was. I mean, what I do know, of course, is that uh, when he was at uh, Cambridge, Prince of Wales joined the UAS, and a chap called Squadron Phil Pinney was his flying instructor there, and he went through the UAS course and got his private pilot's licence. And that's when he decided that he would like to you know, come into the Royal Air Force and to get his wings proper, you know, n nothing sort of shortcutted. I, he did the full jet uh, training phase to, to get his wings. And the Royal Air Force, you know, I, I think, dare I say, rather reluctantly agreed to this uh, because, believe you me, there, there, there was really considerable concern uh, about the, not the security, the safety of the heir to the throne because if you cast your mind back, you know, to the 60s, the accident rate in the Royal Air Force well, it was a damn sight better than it was in the 50s, yeah. but it was still, you know, I mean, the year before, this was being, I don't know, we lost 68 pilots, I think, in six, or 68 air crew, I should be more accurately say. And so there was con very considerable concern um, about his safety uh, in the Royal Air Force. And, you know, I didn't really, I suppose, ha ha what is the word? I, I, I just said, well, yeah, well, fair enough. I can't remember what, what went on in the interview. But as a consequence of that interview, I was sent down to the Queen's flight and I converted onto the Bassett, which was, in my view, one of the most dangerous aeroplanes I've ever flown, <laughs> that's by the way, uh, which Phil Pinney was instructing him on at the, well, he was doing a bit of instructing while basically being a cab driver and <laughs> taking him around the country. So I converted onto the Bassett and I then got an instructor's ticket on the Bassett and I had to get an air support instrument rating which was uh, Air Support Command, was it? I think it was Air Support Command, that instrument rating. And that, they gave me about, I forget, two and a half months to do that lot. And then Phil disappeared to go to Staff College. And then I took over the job of cab driver and instructing uh, Prince Charles, at basically, in fact, did, funny enough, most of it at night, in not very good weather. So I got to know him. Mm. And then in, I think it was late February, March, that's when he joined the Royal Air Force as a member of one graduate entry at Cranwell. And I, meanwhile, had kept current um, on the Jet Provost. And we got these two brand new Mark Vs um, that were you know, almost tailor-made for the job. And I got my own flight, my own airman, and I had a deputy. And uh, we went back to Cranwell and got on with the job.